Right, David, shall we make a start? Perfect. Great. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Vipul Sheth, and I'm joined this morning by David Tuck from Chaser. And our subject today, we're going to discuss building credit control as a service. So really delighted that um, David could join us this morning. And um, just to make sure that the sound, etc., is working, can the audience just raise their hands um, just to confirm that you can all hear us fine? Oh. Not getting any hands up. Can, uh, can everybody hear us? Uh, if it's easier, then just put it in the chat box and let us know that you're able to sort of hear us, but uh, all being well, um, everyone can hear us fine. So we will carry on. Um, for those that, oh uh, yeah, we've got getting messages that people can hear us. So that's great. That's great to hear. Okay. Um, for those that don't have um, uh, sound on their laptops, there's also a, a telephone option, but we'll, we'll get going. Okay. Okay, just a very brief introduction as to who I am. I'm Vipul Sheth. I'm a chartered accountant, chartered tax advisor, trained with a regional firm uh, called Rev Johns as an auditor uh, before moving on to EY KPMG. And I started Advanced Track back in 2003. So um, that's enough about myself. And uh, hopefully the next slide will just take us. Um, just for the benefit, um, if you do have to leave us or you lose sound, etc., the session will be recorded and all being well, it will go live onto our website um, later today. There's a chat and Q&A. This is live, so please use the opportunity to ask myself and David any questions that you want. Um, okay, there we go. Right, David, do you want to kind of take over um, driving now, if you don't I will do. Let me just share my screen, put that on to present mode. So is that coming through okay, Bipple, building credit is. control as a service? With, it is, with, indeed, with yeah. The, with the very, the very chaser orange background. I was going to say, it's very bright orange, so I should have watched it. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, good morning, everyone. My name's, my name's David Tuck, I'm the, the founder and CEO of Chaser. Thank you very much for, for joining Vipul and I this morning and thank you very much Vipul for the opportunity to, to speak to everyone today. I've been really looking forward to this. Great. Right. Just a bit David, of a... David, before we get into the subject matter, can, do you, would you mind just kind of introducing who you are? Sure. And, sure. Um, I, should have, I should have put my sites in a different order, uh, obviously. Okay. <laughs> Okay. No, no, no. Very good. But let's, um, yeah, let's let's just quickly run through that first. So, my name's my name's David Tuck. I'm the, the founder and CEO of, of Chaser. Uh, we're the the market leading cloud credit control software. Have a bit more information about Chaser at the back end of the presentation. But I, what I really want to focus on um, originally is, is kind of credit control and the opportunities that that presents to. Um, yourselves as firms outside of, of kind of anything to do with with chaser as a product we can come on to that um, come on to that second so a bit more information about um, about chaser um, later in the piece uh, a bit about um, about me by way of background so I um, so I mean yeah between Vipul and I I think we cover off 75% uh, of the big four so um, Vipul, EY and KPMG I um, I out of university qualified at Deloitte did my, again, like Vipul, ACA and, and, and CTA qualifications there, and then moved out into, into industry. So I was the first qualified accountant at Fevertree. I imagine some of the audience will be familiar with their range of mixer drinks and, and tonic waters. And then I moved into technology uh, as a finance director, uh, first with a travel and lifestyle social network called Wayne. Uh, and then a, a marketing software business called Idio. And that was where the, the idea for, for what is now Chaser kind of really came to fruit. So Fevertree, Wayne, Idio, all businesses that sold on, on payment terms, so grappling with, with credit control uh, as a problem day in, day out, and, and just finding it incredibly frustrating, thinking there must be a better way of, of, of conducting it, and then got the chance working in tech to 
learn more about software, so did a couple of kind of introduction to computer science courses, started working with, uh, with cloud accounting products within those businesses for our accounts. And yeah, that was where the idea for, for what is now Chaser sort of all, all came together within the melting pot and, and, and the rest, as they say, is history. So again, more information about Chaser a little bit later, but we've been around for, uh, it will be four years next week um, when we launched in August 2014. So yeah, that's a, that's a little bit about me. And if, if it's okay, Vipal, I'll just jump back to... Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. Jump back to the uh, agenda. So we're going to run through the, the problems um, that you can solve uh, for clients when it comes to credit control, how you can help solve them, and, and in a bit more detail on that in terms of the two roles that we really see um, for, for you as accountants in terms of the credit control advisor, but also the tremendous opportunity that, that outsource credit control presents for businesses that have that have never had access to that level of professional credit control and the results that it can bring and then as i've talked about finally after we've we've run through all of that i'll tell you a bit more about um, about chaser and um and how yeah how we work um with our accounting and bookkeeping partners excellent excellent so we've already had about me so yeah so let's talk about um let's talk about the the late payment problem um in terms of you know what what are those um you know what are those issues um, there that that afflict clients? So, well documented uh, kind of struggles uh, in the UK with with late payments. So, Zurich Financial Services released uh, some figures to, um, to to quantify the number of two hundred twenty five billion pounds owed to British SMEs in in overdue invoices. Just so a staggering kind of market failure. Yeah, that's that's that. enormous. And and to give a flavour. Um, how much is actually due? Would a billion pounds? Uh, sorry, one trillion pounds? What what's kind of uh, percentage of debt would that two hundred twenty five represent? So how much is overdue? Yeah, it's interesting because I've seen a different sort of statistic quantified between sort of twenty five and thirty five percent um, of wow. of invoices are overdue, and that's the really really important point to hit on here. For the avoidance of doubt, we are talking about invoices that are overdue. Not yep. outstanding and within their payment terms, which is, you know, which is one's due diligence, right? Like in terms of if I'm going to sell on 36 day, 90 day payment terms, I've got to be prepared to cover um, that, that gap. But this is money that by rights, by expectation should be in, in your client's bank accounts to invest in growth, in creating new jobs, in, in paying a, you know, a larger dividend or paying a dividend at all this yep. year. But, but, but it's... Um, by virtue of by virtue of late payment. Okay. Wow. Okay. Coupled with that, there's just the, the staggering amount of time that um, that the credit control that chasing up customers about uh, about overdue invoices has has historically taken. So um, research from from Sage quantified this at 336 hours um, per year are spent by the average SME chasing late payments and. The reality is that, like that's a that's a huge number in of, of itself, but that number should be higher by virtue of the fact of you know there's a deficit of effective chasing being carried out, as demonstrated by the extent of the 225 billion number. Um, but but the reality is 336 hours is already a huge amount of time. So really, really, you know, money and time, time and money, really, really kind of quantifiable direct problems that that your clients face. As a result of selling on payment terms, okay. And to put that at a more, you know, I, I don't know, you know, if you're like me, you can kind of look at the 225 billion number. You can look at the 336 hours ago. Yeah, okay, that's a big number. But I, I often think that the, the individual story is is the more pertinent. What does that What does that really mean for clients and their businesses? So we've got this example here: signs and labels, who are a fantastic kind of Hereford-based um, custom signage and printing business, family-owned, uh, so set up about 20 years ago by, by John Hughes, his, his son Ross and his daughter Laura now work in the business as well. So the epitome of a, a great family business um, who love their craft, brilliant at their craft, get great reviews um, for the work that they do. But as we see there, you know, we're not pushy people, we don't like chasing money, it's a really stressful thing to have to do. And that, you know, that's so, so common to uh, the overwhelming majority of your client base who sell on payment terms. None of them got into business to carry out credit control. And the result there we see, 
you know, cash flow struggling, £27,000 owed in, in overdue invoices. And that really constraining their ability to grow. So as a business, they need um, this, this piece of machinery called a, a flatbed CNC router um, to remove their dependency on expensive um, sort of outsource, uh, overseas outsource providers um, of, of metal sheeting, um, which you know, are more expensive and as a result are constraining their ability to grow. Um, but they don't have that capital to be able to invest in the machinery that they need to make that step change as a business. So that is real, you know, that's the real kind of cold face of, of late payment of credit control struggles and what it actually fundamentally means for a business like Signs and Labels that they have an opportunity, they are great at what they do, but by virtue of the, the kind of the credit control struggles, they are not able to make that step change to the next level. Okay. So, and, and presumably that, that, that money would enable them to either buy it outright or at least put the deposit down on the machine. Uh, if, they, exactly. if they had that £27,000 in their bank account. Exactly, exactly. And just to get into the, get into the problem itself, so why, why does late payment happen? So, you know, we, we did quite a bit of sort of research and thinking around this, and we, we sort of put them into the three, you know, so the acronym of DAD, Delinquents, Accidentals and Deliberates. <laughs> you know, delinquents happens because, you know, some customers, sometimes you sell to a business that, you know, that's a failing business. They're just not physically, they're not going to have the ability to be a going concern and to pay uh, the relevant invoice. In our experience, you know, we're talking about a tiny fraction of 1% of your invoices will fall, will fall into this category. So these are the ones of it's a question of if it's going to get paid. Um, accidentals and deliberates are when it's going to get paid. And in our experience, you know, I think people conceive that oh, well, delinquents, you know, that's a really common problem. Actually, statistically, you know, we're talking about a tiny fraction of 1% of invoices will actually go, customers and invoices will actually go bad. Um, and that's, you know, that's due diligence at the outset. That's looking for signals of um, you know, customers entering distress and putting them on upfront payment terms in the event that you do have those concerns. But the overwhelming majority of late payment happens because of those when, not if. So the accidentals and the deliberates. The accidentals being, as the name suggests, absent-mindedness of, you know, people are busy and look, realistically, very, very far from the top of their priority list is going to be making sure that you get paid on time. And that's not because they're a, it's not because they're a bad person, it's because they've got so many other uh, kind of things to, to, to do that are pressing to their ability to grow and succeed um, as a business. Yeah. No. Slightly more sinister, we've got our, we've got our deliberates um, who, again, it's when, not if, but these are, pe you know, these are people who, who take the opportunistic view of, well, look, you know, I'm not a charity. I'm not going to voluntarily put money in your bank account. I'm going to leave it in mine. Yeah, it's earmarked. I'll pay it. I'll pay it as and when, but for now, I'd far sooner have that cushion in my bank account um, than, than voluntarily put it in yours. Well, it's, it's funny. When I saw that list, it reminded me of one of my early audits. And I went into the financial controller's office and I said, oh, I can see this supplier um, is on well beyond the normal credit terms. And they said they've never chased us, so we've never paid them. So it reminded me very much of real life, uh, you know, exactly as you've described that, well, I'd rather it was in our bank account than theirs. Indeed. And really that's it. I know, you know, there will be, you know, there'll be nuances between, um, you know, different customers and different people there. But, but the reality is all of late payment can be put into one of those three categories. Yep. And delinquents being a very, very small, tiny percentage and then the overwhelming majority of that 225 billion number being either accidentals or deliberates. And then onto the solution to that problem, having identified the causes of, um, of late payment, as we, as we like to say at Chaser, our, our three Ps, light, assistance, pays. And why? Because quite simply, it surfaces. If there is a genuine obstacle to payment, which there will be sometimes, you know, sometimes the invoice will be, there'll be a discrepancy, you know, the, the customer won't have been happy with the goods or services 
and I politely, persistently chasing, it brings that issue to the surface such that it can get resolved. And then when it comes to, you know, so Vipul, your example from the, um, the early audit, you know, where it is a deliberate who's opportunistically saying, well, I'll leave the money in my bank account, it forces them to justify the unjustifiable. Yep. You know, do they have an objection? No. Okay, then why are you continuing not to pay the invoice? So it does, it forces their hand. So we are, we're talking about the accidentals and we're talking about the, the deliberates here, but that's why polite persistence pays, because if there are issues, it brings them to the surface. If there aren't any issues, well, how can um, that customer continue um, to, to justify not paying that invoice? And quite simply, they can't. Yeah. And so what does this look like, this, this polite persistence pays? So broadly speaking, and look, there will be some overlap here and there will be some kind of phone coming in between emails um, at certain stages, but, but broadly speaking, it looks, like a, it looks like a funnel. So we've got email as our first line of attack. We've then got phone um, as, as our next kind of um, medium of escalation. And then you know, in more sort of extreme cases, we'll have a, a legal letter, a letter before action, and then if we really feel like we've exhausted um, all avenues, we'll pass that invoice to, to a debt collector. And that's why debt collectors at the bottom, and again, should be just a tiny fraction of the cases because in the overwhelming majority, it's when, not if. If there are any objections, polite persistence pays because it brings them to the surface where they can get resolved. And really your legal letter and debt collector are, are only in those most extreme cases um, where that polite persistence can't bring the matter to a successful resolution. So we talked about why polite, talked about why late payment happens. We talked about why polite persistence pays. We talked about what this looks like in terms of an approach. Why then the lack of effective credit control? And people will be familiar with your Eisenhower matrix of you know four quadrants: uh, important versus unimportant, urgent versus not urgent, and credit control. I'm quite fond of the the analogy of it's like it's like washing the dishes in terms of <laughs> if if you do it and you do it daily it's not too much effort and everything kind of stays clean if you don't do it over a period of time you know things go kind of really badly wrong and you know kind of rot and mold builds up and then it becomes a much harder task to put right um, but in the household isn't it <laughs> indeed but in the moment credit control can it, it's not ostensibly urgent it's you know it can be it's not a, oh we really need to do this today um but it is such an important kind of insurance policy if you will against bigger problems but so much of it is in the case of particularly for people who don't have that kind of um scale and don't have that proficiency to spend the time on credit control, it so often falls by the wayside because it doesn't, it's not obviously urgent. And whilst it's important, it doesn't get done. Coupled with the fact that, you know, there is a, an inherent aversion to asking people for money. People feel awkward um, about doing it. And that's why we get the deficit of effective credit control and we get the scale of problems like the 225 billion pounds owed to UK SMEs in overdue invoices. Okay. So, cool. That's the background. Now let's bring it on to, um, on to you um, as, as accountants. And speaking as, as an accountant myself, both you know, having been in practice, but also having been in industry and working with our external accountants, your historic role in terms of your service offering and clients credit control. Personally, I think probably the level of overlap in terms of circles here is, is slightly generous. Um, in terms of how much involvement you, you've had in credit control. Um, because, I mean, in my experience, the full extent of it has, has been that, yeah, maybe you do a bit of recoverability assessment on overdue invoices at year end. Uh, and, yeah, maybe if you were the kind of the on-site part-time bookkeeper coming in for one or two days a month, you might do a bit of credit control as and when you, as and when you came in. But really, that's been... The, the full extent of, of your involvement. But I'd be very keen to get people's perspectives on this and, and, and particularly, you know, so yours, Ripple, and, and all kind of participants. Does, does that chime with you that like, our perspective is very much that credit control just hasn't been a thing that you see as, as your... I, I, I think you're absolutely right, David. I think historically, 
um, uh, accountancy firms have never offered bookkeeping, let alone credit control. Um, but with cloud now being front and center, um, the access to that information is much easier um, because it's, it's in the cloud. Uh, you're able to process transactions for, for clients without ever visiting the, the client offices um, because there are bank feeds, there are sales invoices, um, there are purchase invoices that go through OCR, etc. Um, so we certainly see that as being um, um, a sort of major, major part of um, what's going forward is the ability to um, um, get access to real-time information, which makes it a lot easier to chase for, chase for money. Um, and I've just got one of the um, uh, attendees saying, silly thing is when we chase for a client, we're very effective, which reminds me of our year-end debt, debtor um, confirmation balances. Um, they were incredibly effective in collecting money because they thought it was the accountant chasing for the money. But, <laughs> um, uh, but you know, that, I don't, that's what I'm seeing now. Is, whereas in the past, as accounting firms, we perhaps weren't in the role of providing that service. Um, I see us, and I'm talking as a general thing for the profession, but certainly from our perspective as a provider to the profession, uh, we're doing a lot more of the processing compared to what used to happen, which was you had a panel of bookkeepers that you recommended. The mm -hmm. clients uh, went and spoke to see if they actually had the capacity to 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 do the do the work on a once a week, once a month kind of basis. Perfect. Uh, yeah, does thank that you. kind of ring true with your own experience, David. Very much so, very much so. And yeah, really interesting to get um, kind of Patrick's point as well. And uh, that, that very much chimes with, um, with what I'll come on to in terms of, of outsourced credit control. And I think the tremendous opportunity that it, um, that it pre presents in terms of, of your service offering. Yeah, excellent. So that's historic role. So great to get that kind of, that, that validation and that clarity and then the new role. So that's very much my my goal today to um, to hopefully um, that you come away seeing that you know clients credit control is very much your domain now, very much your arena um, to be able to add really huge value to your clients and deliver them the very kind of tangible benefits that that ultimately credit control achieves in terms of. The, all the benefits of kind of having that that sort of improved cash flow, that that freedom to um, to invest, create new jobs, and like I say, pay um, sort of larger dividends if if that's the route you want to go down. So really, just a tremendous, exciting opportunity that um, I, I, that technology now enables that wasn't that wasn't possible previously, where um, you know where the access to kind of sales invoice information just lived on the desktop within the client's business. Yeah. And so how, how can you help? So broadly speaking, it's two different areas. It's, it's managing credit control for clients as part of your virtual finance function offering. So for the audience of that here, we're just talking about where you are already providing bookkeeping services to, um, to that client that sells on payment terms. Uh, be that because you've got a bookkeeping team kind of you know, in-house within your team or you're, um, you're working with an organization like Advanced Track. And so the opportunity for you to broaden that remit in terms of saying, okay, now we're not just kind of, you know, doing your bookkeeping and potentially doing your management accounts as well. Um, we are also doing your credit control for you. And then advising clients on, on better uh, kind of credit control. So these would be for your larger clients who have uh, the, the, sort of the economies of scale to have some form of internal finance team, helping them helping that finance team be more effective with the system that they use, but also health checking for them on an ongoing basis to make sure as part of the advisory remit that you deliver to them, that they are getting the very best credit control results that they could do. So to go into those in a bit more detail, let's talk, yeah, let's talk the role of the, the credit control advisor. So we're gonna come back to, um, we're gonna come back to signs and labels who we mentioned earlier. 
So Hinder Pocock, their, their accountants, uh, who um, you know, worked with them to, um, to implement Chaser um, and put in place new kind of credit control practices um, underpinned by Chaser as a system and the results that that delivered to them. So brought that outstanding debt from £27,000 down to £5,000. And we went back to the, the CNC router and, and, and Vipo, I don't know whether you'd, you'd read the case study previously or just subliminally. I have seen, I have, uh, I have read this one actually, yeah. Okay, so, but, but in terms of that CNC router, fantastic. That then enabled them to put down the deposit um, on that as a, um, as a piece of machinery. And as we see at the there, how that's empowered their next stage of growth. We can become a supplier to the whole county with this. Just the impact that then that then has on on their relationship with their accountants, Kinder Pocock, who ultimately, I, you know, what's a good what's a good analogy? Like, um, if anyone's familiar with you know American football, um, you know, the kind of signs and labels were always kind of an incredibly talented sort of running back, you know, kind of huge uh, sort of potential. Kinder Pocock have been the run blocker, the, you know, who broken through. The kind of line and given them the opportunity by helping them put the new kind of credit control systems in place to get to that next stage of growth to unlock that potential by investing in um, that new piece of machinery as a result of improving their credit control performance so just huge huge benefits um sort of you know heroic impact um that um that kinder pocock as accountants have, have delivered and presumably with with this it it's as you say it's the polite persistence which enable them to not only solve it at that moment in time, but to keep it at absolutely where it was very manageable. So the conversations weren't with 50 customers. It was with the handful of customers that were not responding to those reminders. Absolutely. And I think this is where it's, so that's absolutely, absolutely true. And it's not just about, it's not just about here's a system you should use. It's the, because we go back to earlier, we're not pushy, you know, the, the quote from Signs and Labels, we're not pushy people, you know, not liking doing this. So it's the, you know, it's the reassurance, it's the kind of the advice to not just here's a system you use, you know, go off and find a way, which in reality we see so often is never going to happen. That's why, you know, accountants are our like primary partners, primary, um, you know, way that we take our product to market because we recognize that it's the role, it's the trust, it's the expertise that you're able to bring alongside what is the, the system you should be using it's the how to use it and the reassurance that you know this is how other clients do it and this is this is going to be okay it's not going to cause any damage to client relationships because customer relationships because like persistence pays and as long as it's always polite then you know it's a never inflammatory it's never going to do any damage but it definitely needs you know that role of the accountant as the trusted advisor and the kind of the, the council to help put it in place is absolutely integral. Excellent, excellent. No, I, you know, I think the, the important bit is the, yes, it brings it down, but it keeps it down. I think that's, that's the key yes. way here, really, yeah. that um, they're not having to, because I've seen it in many businesses, they go through a blitz of chasing everybody up, and that 27,000 went down to five. But then in three months' time, it re-emerged yeah. <laughs> because there wasn't a person uh, yeah. actually chasing the money. But this, I guess the whole purpose of Chaser is you don't need people to do the chasing. It's keeping your records up to date, which then enables that timely reminder at the appropriate juncture that, oh, by the way, did you know this invoice is due next week or tomorrow? or it was due last week, for example. So. And that's absolutely right. And look, I think what I would distinguish between is, yeah, you're so right. It's that putting something in place for the long term that will bring debt to days down, improve cash flow, but sustain it at that level. So we talk about polite persistence pays. It's persistent over the, over the long term, right? It's, you know, week in, week out, you're staying on top of customers, um, you know, as opposed to <laughs> what's, you know, polite panic pays. <laughs> but it only pays in the very short term and yep. then the problem you know reappears it needs to be persistent it needs to be it needs to be a process that you continue to have in place um, and that's what that's what you as accountants will be advising your clients on and helping them get in place that 
absolutely can bring those debtor days down and then sustain them at that level. And, in, in, and you may be com covering this later, so apologies if I'm kind of stepping on that. In terms of the ability for the accountant in this case, were they able to charge for this service or was it something that was then managed in-house? What, what does that kind of relationship look like? And sure. ultimately, I, you know, can firms monetize um, the service um, and the value that um, between using your technology and the other services of the virtual finance function yeah. uh, enables them to do? Absolutely. So that brings me on to my, um, that, that segues brilliantly into my next slide. So the way that, the way that it works is deliver like, paid for training around getting it set it up, getting it set up as a, as an advisory engagement, then um, the opportunity to um, deliver ongoing credit control health checks is again, fee generating advisory engagements because that's the important point to recognize here it's not just about for you as an advisor it's not just about signs and labels it's about you know let's say you have 100 clients that sell on payment terms that you kind of help improve their credit control processes this is the benefit of, of cloud technology and we'll come on to this when we talk about chaser specifically a little bit later you then have the vantage point to benchmark best practice across your client base what's working well, what's not working well, and then you have the ability to go to clients. And you know, this will even be clients who have you know, extensive finance teams in place, um, and so are very proficient when it comes to how to carry out a credit control. But what they don't have is your vantage point that you have across the client base to benchmark best practice, to deliver those aggregated insights to your clients to help them better carry out their credit control. So what we've seen work best is actually you know, maybe you should start chasing a little bit earlier before the due date, or maybe you should hold off, or maybe you should, you know, maybe you should add a phone call in earlier in the piece. That vantage point that you have, and again, this is the huge benefit of cloud technology, this is something that you have, an, a sort of an intellectual property asset as an accountant, that none of your clients will have individually, because none of, you know, it's not like all 100 of them are going to get together and talk about, you know, their credit control and how to to best carry out thing, you know, best uh, kind of conduct it to get the best results. So that's a huge opportunity that you have to uh, benchmark that best practice and then proactively deliver that advice, see what they're doing, see across the spectrum what has worked, and then provide suggestions about how um, they can they can better carry out credit control. The third and final point of the sorry, yeah, in, in that in that, um, do you also see some potential issues if clients um, or the firms haven't got up-to-date data that it kind of you're, you're chasing for something with you'd end up potentially upsetting customers of the business because that information isn't up to date and that's absolutely. just an example absolutely so um i mean in terms of chaser as a system one of the sort of quid pro quos if you will is that you need to be able to do your bank rec in respect of your sales invoices in, ter in terms of your purchases and your expenses, it, it doesn't matter, right? Because that doesn't have any impact upon your credit control. But in terms of your sales invoices, you need to be able to have it up to date at least once a week. It doesn't matter when. It can be, you know, it can be Monday morning, it can be Thursday afternoon, it can be Sunday evening, whenever you want. Yeah. Uh, but you do need to be able to do it at least once a week. And actually, we found that um, this is completely unexpected, but this is a real kind of positive for firms in terms of, you know, pushing clients to update their bookkeeping more regularly so that it's a good like forcing factor for them of, yeah, okay, you can improve your credit control, you can improve your cash flow, but you're going to have to adjust your kind of bank reconciliation processes. But then off the bat, and clients will be willing to do that because they want the benefits of, um, of, of improved credit control and better cash flow. But that then also offers you know, benefits to you as a firm in terms of more up-to-date information. So, you know, you can start using a kind of a, a reporting tool, for example, more effectively for that client because you have more up-to-date data and better quality of management information with which to deliver them advice. So I would, yeah, I definitely recommend thinking about it in that context of this is a great persuasive tool to help get clients to improve their bookkeeping processes. But you're right, they would need to be able to um, update their, their sales invoice information in terms of bank rec at least once a week. Brilliant. Uh, that's, that's really, yeah. Great, thanks for clarifying that.
And then just, I mean, the final thing is, and I'll come on to it in terms of our partner pricing in a, in a little bit, um, but you know, the way that our partners will do it is they will manage the subscription for their clients because we offer um, very sort of preferential um, partner pricing um, to, um, to our accounting and bookkeeping partners. Um, so effectively selling, you know, Chaser wholesale um, to, to you. Um, and that then gives you the ability to deliver Chaser at a, um, at a preferential rate to the recommended retail prices, which is just further bolstering um, the, the client relationship and, and bolstering the goodwill. And I mean, just on that point, David, I, and I often have this conversation with, with firms uh, about how to price services. Would it, um, you almost kind of value price it and you don't talk about what Chaser costs, you talk about the service and what you're offering and it's for you as a firm to use the tools that most effectively enable you to deliver that service. Uh, presumably that's a, you know, there may be some uh, clients who do some of the work themselves, um, say, you know, reconciling the bank receipts, et cetera, because they've got remittance advices, et cetera. But in terms of if it is that fully fledged finance function that the firm's taking on, presumably you don't price, oh, it's X pounds for JSO. You just say, actually, for us to perform the credit control, it's Y, and you kind of roll that price in. I mean, do you see that sort of behavior within your partner firms? Yes, and definitely, uh, definitely, definitely when it comes to the delivering outsourced credit control as a service, when it comes to the credit control advisor, it's more mixed because it's not a it's not a sort of monthly credit control service you're providing. Right. You'll do, the, you'll do the original training and setup assistance, and then you'll do the three six monthly credit control health checks. And, and in the interim, the the client will be managing credit control themselves using <laughs> Spacer. So don't get me wrong; there there are ways you can package that up in terms of you know. A holistic service uh, but equally we do we definitely see more firms in that um, in that situation um, kind of taking the approach of um, sort of separating out the cost for okay no, no, no that's great perfect okay so let me um, let me just come on to outsource credit control so this is the, the sort of the huge um, opportunity um, when it comes to those clients who kind of say don't have the ability to carry out credit control um, really well. So, you know, over 90% um, of SMEs are, are one to nine um, kind of team members. Um, so, you know, never going to have the economies of scale to have, you know, an in-house finance team, let alone, you know, someone with kind of credit control um, expertise. So look, let's go back to our 225 billion number. You know, pound for pound, you know, relative to turnover, relative to size of business, that disproportionately afflicts smaller businesses because it's an uneven playing field. Like you've got your, you know, you've got your larger corporates who can have dedicated credit control teams. Don't get me wrong, technology could for sure help them carry out credit control more efficiently, but probably not in terms of getting credit credit control results because they have the ability to invest in that team. Whereas it's the, the kind of the one to nine uh, employee SMEs who just don't have that econ those economies of scale, and they're the ones who who you know can't bring to bear the polite persistence that pays effectively, you know, because like we talked about earlier with the the kind of the four quadrant matrix and the aversion to to kind of asking people for money, they just you know they don't have access to expert credit control. You have the opportunity to provide it. In terms of you know the virtual finance function that um, that you know is becoming more and more prevalent now for those one to nine kind of person SMEs who you have the ability with kind of cloud accounting to and and you know say an expense automation kind of product you know bookkeeping product you have the ability to deliver kind of you know finance function um, as a service and you now have the ability to extend that further into helping with the, the client's credit control. So again, another case study, like, um, so Farnell Clark, um, who brilliant accounting firm, um, kind of like, like Kinder Pocock, um, yeah, brilliant accounting firm in, um, in Norwich, 
Um, one of their clients, PT Lock and, um, Lock and Safe, you know, their cash flow was not where it should have been, you know, really struggling um, with kind of um, the credit control side of things. Now, Farnell Clark, as part of being the virtual finance function for um, PT Lock and Safe, are doing the credit control um, kind of for them. And so you know, that's now someone, you know, the, the bookkeeper within the Farnell Clark team for PT Lock and Safe, um, you know, oversees Chaser and delivers credit control to them as a service. And you see the results there, you know, 4,000 recovered of overdue invoices in, in less than four weeks. Some of it went back as far back as 2016. So effectively just, you know, a windfall for PT Lock and Safe as a business that, again, changes the game for them. And per, you know, Vipul, your point earlier, gives them the ability to maintain um, kind of cash flow at that new and improved healthy level and just, you know, have a sort of better, you know, almost better cash flow quality of life, if you will. Sure. No, no, no. That's that's great. Excellent. Perfect. So, so yeah, and that's yeah. presumably because they're offering the bookkeeping service. They're they're doing everything on behalf of, in this instance, this particular client. But um, it's part of a wider service, presumably that Barnell Clark have been able to offer a range of clients. Because I am, um, I think all their clients are on the cloud, are they not? That's right, and and you're absolutely right. So for the avoidance of doubt here, outsource credit control just doesn't doesn't work in our you know in our experience. If you're not also kind of responsible for the bookkeeping, yeah, because you know it's it stands if in a sort of you know standing on the shoulders of giants sense. Credit control, outsourced credit control, virtual credit control stands on the shoulders of of the bookkeeping. Yeah. No, very much. Fantastic. Great. So, you know, real value that, you know, we can see that um, firms can offer to their clients. I mean, we're, we're coming up to, uh, let's have a look. I'm trying to think, where, where are we? about 45 minutes in if anyone's got any questions for for david or myself please do do ask us because um that's the whole purpose of this um in terms of this how you know how much are you seeing not just here david in the uk but around the world um the outsourced bookkeeping and the outsourced credit control kind of helping firms to one develop their relationships with clients uh, but also, and I guess ultimately, most importantly, how they're able to expand their service offering and revenue as a, as a, as a result. Sure. So let me just jump onto my, jump onto my next slide. So, I mean, in terms of, in terms of improving the relationship with clients, um, now I think, cause it's just, it's such a headline grabber, right? In terms of, you know, we've been able to deliver you this quantifiable benefit from a cash flow perspective. You know, being able to quantify to the pound, you know, the, the cash flow boost that you've um, been able to deliver as a result of improving their credit control and articulating the, well, that's like a free investment in, you know, say PT Lock and Save and by having, it's almost like an insurance policy now going forwards, by having us doing your credit control, you've got to, complete peace of mind that you know it will always be at that level and as a as a business continues to grow then effectively the, the value of that in free investment becomes larger and larger compared to um the sort of the old um the old bad kind of debt days that you used to have versus the new kind of improved outsourced credit control um enhanced debt days and what we're really seeing in the market is that you know firms recognizing this is a huge opportunity to differentiate ourselves you know, so let's say we have two firms, both of whom offer virtual finance function um, services to clients and you know, both do an equally good job of the bookkeeping, the management um, kind of accounting, et cetera. But it's a, it's a client whose business sells on payment terms. What we're seeing firms kind of recognize is the opportunity to differentiate themselves in the market, but also the threat that it poses if they don't um, kind of build the, the service offering in this way to be able to go and say, well, look, okay, great, we can do all of you know, the kind of bookkeeping, the management accounting, but you know, we can help you get your invoices paid on time. If you're a firm that's saying, well, look, we'll do, we want the virtual finance function work, we'll do all of this, but we don't, we don't touch credit control. Where, where's credit control? Like, 
if you're taking the rest of the finance function out of the business internally, even though you know they may not have been doing a very good job of it previously, where's where's credit control going to go? Because to the extent that there was someone who covered finance within the business, there's even there's going to be even less of a need for them because the bookkeeping and the management accounting work is um, is going, um, and therefore credit control is is almost going to become more difficult. Yeah, it is going to become more difficult to find a place for than it than it was even before. So recognizing that as an opportunity to say, you know, a, a huge kind of box to be able to tick in terms of the service offering, and because it, you know, it's so so quantifiable in terms of the impact, what we're seeing is firms, yeah, recognize that this is this is a great way for me to differentiate um, myself from from competitors because you know, I'm able to offer credit control too. So you know, we see about seventy five percent of businesses sell their goods and services on payment terms. So for the other twenty five percent, this isn't relevant. But for those other seventy five percent, this is a huge ability to say, look. We are virtual finance function providers who do this. If you don't have that, where are you, you know, within your one to nine person business, how are you going to carry it out? Yeah. No, I, I think also, I think credit control, it's a nat natural extension of um, good bookkeeping. Um, so if you've got good records and are able to be that trusted person that the client goes to, the fact that you can say to them, well, when they come to you and say, oh, as you, you know, in your signs and labels example, um, where look, we'd love to buy this machine, but we don't know how to fund it. Um, and the accountant could go in and say, well, actually, if we could make inroads into this, we'll be in a better position to do it. And I think that's, um, you know, testament to one, the accountant, but two, to the process that is there uh, on an ongoing basis. Absolutely. And just a few things here, you know, you need to define the service. You know, is it email only or email plus calls? Set up the process for what happens in terms of objections. You know, in terms of, you know, if a customer comes back saying, well, this invoice were, was for goods or services I wasn't happy with, you know, you're not going to be able to answer that as, the, um, as a virtual credit control provider. So what is the process you put in place with the client to, to deal with that? Um, how do you staff it? Is it in terms of, is it junior bookkeeper? Do you have a dedicated credit controller you know, within the team who's then drafted into the relevant client jobs? Um, and what we see in terms of pricing, like definitely trying to kind of fix price, um, definitely not time and materials, um, unless you, you, know, you absolutely can't avoid it, which from experience you, you absolutely can. It just takes a bit of work and insight. And, and we've built up a lot of kind of insight from firms that we've worked with about how best to price um, which is, is something we can really help with. But yeah, what we see work best is price according to volume of invoices or, or customers chase. Um, and then, you know, reviewing that on an ongoing basis so that you can then, um, you know, say every six months, if there's been massive growth in um, the, the client's business, make sure that what you're charging um, reflects the level of work that you're carrying out. Okay, great. Now, I'm conscious that, um, you know, we, we probably run pretty long on time already so i'm going to keep i'm going to keep the chaser section very brief um if that's okay with you that's then, absolutely fine everyone stayed with us david so um obviously we're we're talking about stuff that people genuinely find of interest and uh, so yeah please kind of make sure we we cover off the things and um as i say if the audience has any further questions please carry on so please let us know Fantastic. All right. Well, look, I'm going to run through Chaser very briefly because um, we can follow up afterwards um, to, to kind of have one on one conversations if anyone's interested in taking the discussion forward about, about how we can work together. But just very briefly, Chaser is the kind of market leading cloud software platform for credit control. So um, if anyone's familiar with the, uh, with the Ron Seal adverts, uh, it's sort of, it, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, that's that's very much us um, in terms of how we've named our software. So uh, the first part of us, the product is um, automation. So automatically chase uh, kind of customers about their outstanding invoices without losing the human touch. So that's absolutely kind of paramount. What what we what we are not is a substitute for human intervention within the credit control process. We are absolutely a catalyst for it. Because if you remove human intervention from the credit control process and it's, it's communication that looks and feels clearly automated, it loses such a, human, a huge amount of its impact and, and, and customers on the receiving end can just ignore it. 
The second part of us as a product is, um, is, is the CRM, is the, the consolidation of all um, kind of communication um, in relation to credit control. So um, all emails that go out, all replies that flow, flow back and forth, and that's a really important point. All of those replies automatically logged within Chaser, notes of any telephone calls um, you make. And this is a key, key enabler of, of outsourced credit control. So the ability to say to clients that we can do your credit control for you, but what we can do is provide you with a system where at any time you can jump in and see everything that we've done. And I really mean everything. So all of the chases that have been sent, all of the replies that have gone back and forth in conversation with your, with your customers and notes of any telephone calls that we've made instantly available to you. And we can, you know, we can add notes and, and agree, you know, those objection handling. So where a customer comes back, says and, and complains um, about a particular item. Having that logged within, um, logged within the, the shared kind of cloud communication platform, absolutely essential. It wouldn't be possible to deliver outsourced credit control if that weren't in place because clients need that, that peace of mind to know how their customers are going to be communicated with um, you know, in the event that they do just to address that fear of something, of something going wrong. Yeah, no, and, and, in turn, and you may be covering it in the next slide, what products does Chaser integrate with um, to kind of speed up the whole process? Absolutely. So we, we integrate with Zero, QuickBooks Online, and we're just um, finalizing our integration with Sage Business Cloud Accounting. So what was, what was Sage One? Okay, excellent. Brilliant. And then the third and final part of us as a product is, is intelligence. So um, to know who to grant credit to, how best to chase um, kind of customers up, um, you know, those, so like I talked about earlier, that ability to benchmark across the client base um, for you as accountants so that you are informed to be able to um, kind of best advise clients how they should be carrying out credit control where they're managing chasing themselves or how best to carry it out yourselves on behalf of your clients where you're delivering outsourced credit control to them. So what, what, I mean, you know, if you don't want to answer, that's fine. What would that look like? Is it average debt to days or? Yeah, absolutely. So who are your good paying customers, who are your bad paying customers? So there's a huge amount of, huge amount of flexibility within us as a product. Um, um, yeah, huge amount of flexibility within us as a product to tailor that different chasing horses for different chasing courses. So segment your good paying customers and your bad paying customers your uh, different payment terms kind of customers from others. So providing you, never, never us unilaterally taking decisions on your behalf, but providing you with the intelligence to be able to make the best credit control decisions. Excellent, no, that's, that's great. And, and just for the benefit, um, there's uh, one of the attendees has asked uh, which products Chaser works sure. with. Uh, just, for, um, I'll repeat, it's uh, Zero QuickBooks, and the Sage Online product. That's right, yeah. So uh, Zero QuickBooks Online, and Sage Business Cloud Accounting, or Sage Accounting, which is what was formerly Sage One. Great, lovely, thank you. Perfect. All right. Brilliant. So, and then uh, just a bit about who we, so um, nearly four years old, founded in 2014, you know, born out of my experiences as, um, as an accountant um, FD, um, and then backed by some, some fantastic investors, so Sussex Base Ventures, Beacon Capital, a couple of, of, of London-based venture capitalists, and then um, a couple of angel investors, one of whom, Craig Winkler, who was the co-founder of MYOB, um, so the Australasian equivalent of Sage, and then very early investor in Zero, and still um, still a director on Zero's board, so very active investor in the space, so um, kind of thrilled to, to have his endorsement. Um, as an investor as well. Brilliant. No, that, that's fantastic. You know, and, you know, as somebody who kind of has been working with lots of firms in the cloud, you know, lots of our firms um, have been using uh, Chaser, I'm fully aware of, and, uh, and the wider market as a whole. So, you know, it's great to see, you know, David and his team doing what, what they're doing. And, this slide just kind of goes to show how successful that process has been, you know, award-winning um, uh, offering both as a product and, and the service that you're able to, to deliver as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you. And I, I won't, I'm conscious of time and I won't kind of 
um, sort of, uh, you know, restate um, anything that's stated there. But yeah, I think that we've still got so much that we're very excited um, about doing to enhance and improve our product offering, um, you know, and, and sort of the whole of product offering of, of sort of how we work with our, with our partners and users. I think we have a very, you know, we have a strong degree of confidence that we're the sort of recognized leader within our respective category, which is great. And yeah, just so, so much more still to do. No, that's that's superb, superb, brilliant. Well, um, have you got any other slides, David? So I'm gonna I'm gonna just skip through. Um, I'm just gonna skip through to the end because um, yeah, I, we can cover a lot more of this on sort of one-on-one -on -one calls afterwards. But what I did just want to cite within one thing we've really realised over the last six months is it, it's not just about the product. Like, I'm, you know, really, really proud of our product and the impact that it can have. But it's about our sort of whole of product offering and the way that we support you as firms. So we have our, our partner success process, um, which, which some may have seen uh, kind of on social media. So the certification training that we provide to our partners to really help you make the best use of Chaser for your clients. Um, so, you know, knowing the product inside out, knowing how to kind of present it. Um, to clients so that you are really on the front foot and, and hopefully excited to then um, You know go out to clients and say, you know This can really help you and I'm going to be the one who can kind of you know Handhold you through this process and and you know deliver the product not just something that they can benefit from But with all of the insights and expertise to be able to do that now what we also have in that regard is our um, so um, I mean it's been me to date, but we've um, we've just hired um, a dedicated credit control consultant, which is a guy who's come from one of our users. Um, so great, really experienced in credit control. So he, alongside me, like you know, solely focused on working with our accounting and bookkeeping partners to design and develop their outsourced credit control processes. Um, so because he brings a wealth of expertise from from having done credit control, he also used Chaser at his um, at his last company. So that's something that we're able to to offer to our partners as well. That that consultation, that training, because we appreciate it's one of those things that you know outsourced credit control sounds great, but then when you get into it, there's lots of that. Well, how the hell do I do this? How do I price it? How do I deal with the objections? You know, how many emails? What what service level agreement do I? Kind of define with my clients how do i make sure that there's not scope creep all of that you know we are able to provide you with our insights and best practice across all of the firms that we work with so that you can go and take that kind of outsourced credit control service to to market and to you know how to pilot it originally um to to your clients so what i'm really trying to get across here is that um you know it's very much not just about the product it's you know we are with you kind of it's a bit of a cliche, but we're we're with you every step of the way. No, that no, that's great, and and presumably some of that is delivered face to face, but others, other um, support is using videos and and the and that sort of uh, support material. Absolutely, yeah. So a mix of kind of calls, meetings, and then the the kind of um, you know the the sort of um, written and video content that we have. Okay, and and the pricing of that and the product itself that you would discuss on a firm by firm basis as to sort of what level of support they're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. so we would, um, yeah, absolutely. So we have our sort of preferential partner wholesale pricing, which I, I'm conscious of time, I won't run through today. Yeah, um, that's fine. Absolutely fine. That, what, what we'd love for you to do is drop us an email at partner at chaserhq.com and then we can arrange a one-on-one -on -one call to, yeah, you know, absolutely no commitment that's just an exploratory learn more about chaser have a detailed demo of the product and we can run through our through our partner proposition with you there fantastic brilliant well thank you so much uh, for your time today david uh, you know the fact that everyone stayed with us to the end i think is testament to the fact that it's been really useful from my point of view thank you again um you know we we certainly see a huge growth in bookkeeping that we're working with firms on um so you know outsourced credit control seems a natural extension of not only what uh, the firms are doing but what we're doing on their behalf so just leaves me to say thanks again and um hopefully you'll you'll join us uh, on our next webinar which is which is in a few weeks time so please go to advancedtrack.com and look at our webinars page and you'll, you'll see what what's on next so thanks again thanks david 
Brilliant. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you, everyone. And yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. Lovely. Thanks again. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.